Freddie Mercury said that going to the opera for the first time changed his life. <coughs> he went on to make a recording with the legendary soprano Montserrat Caballé. This leads down two paths, the importance of access, and as I've already touched on, the interconnection, the arts, and with the broader creative industries. My Lords, the economic benefits of the wider creative industries, their essential role in fostering tourism, are a hugely important and welcome consequence of investing in the arts. But there is this consensus on the importance of arts, but it does not extend to the teaching of creative subjects, which forms the talent pipeline that sustains the creative industries. The number of music teachers in state schools is decreasing, while subjects such as drama and dance, which are not coveted, uh, covered by similar legal requirements, are being given up altogether. This means that in practice, pupils from state-funded schools will find it increasingly difficult to develop their artistic abilities and creativity, resulting in an even greater chasm between state and independent schools, and in consequence between the privileged and the underprivileged. In fact, the creative industry is found to be among the most elitist ones, being dominated by the privileged to the extent, to the similar extent such as doctors and lawyers. I do not see any possibility for levelling up without the government addressing this crisis at the educational level. We must ensure that art and creativity do not become one of the luxuries only available to the rich, not only for the sake of those less privileged, but also for the good of our society. Art should be created by people from all backgrounds. Coming from Liverpool, I'll remind your Lordships of four working class lads who in the 1960s gave us some of the best music in this country mm. that the world has known. I realise times are difficult, but we must all make some concessions. Let me emphasise this once again. Art and creative education is not something we can afford to neglect as a nation. I want to go back to uh, the beginning of Viscount Chandos' speech. He quoted Churchill. And as he quoted Churchill, I thought of the most memorable, iconic photograph to come out of the war. St. Paul's Cathedral Dome, rising above the smoke of the Blitz. I'm sure all your Lordships have seen it or variations of it. And it symbolized just how much we depend upon our heritage, and if that heritage is endangered, our very history and identity is endangered. There is a lot of very strong evidence about the potential for arts, culture and heritage to help shape the place where we live and to generate direct and indirect benefits for local communities. The Reimagining Where We Live report from the DCS, DCMS Select Committee in the other place drew on this evidence to show how art, culture and the creative industries can help levelling up by supporting education, building local pride, generating jobs and enhancing health and well-being. But the report also noted pervasive and persistent barriers to this kind of cultural placemaking, highlighting geographical disparities poor levels of social mobility and inclusivity in the cultural sector, and skills shortages across the creative industries. But levelling up will not work if it is top-down. Cultural strategies set at a local level, in partnership, these can deliver vibrant cultural ecosystems that will create jobs, support health and well-being, enhance learning, open up opportunities for young people, support the growing creative industries, and ultimately make for places in which people want to live, work, and can thrive. I have always been and remain a committed supporter of the Arts Council model, at the heart of which lie the two main principles that animated its founders in 1948. The first, that the arts are a public good from which everyone benefits, and they should therefore receive public support and second, that the funds allocated to the arts by government should be administered at arm's length from government through a body making independent decisions about exactly where and with whom money should be invested. These principles, my lords, have frequently been troublesome to governments of all complexions, but even though our cultural landscape is much changed since 1948, I believe they are still worth defending 
and I fear that both are now under serious threat. In the last portfolio, um, we saw that London was benefiting disproportionately, receiving around £21 per capita compared to an average of £6 per capita in the rest of the country. Even accounting for the important role uh, that London plays as our capital and the wonderful organisations uh, that, are, that are housed there, that is a stark discrepancy. 133 local authorities across England didn't receive any funding, not a penny. A national portfolio should be based across the nation. Arts, culture and creativity are all enriched when everybody is able to tell and share their stories and I congratulate the Arts Council for its work to enable that. By increasing investment outside London, the Arts Council will help to generate culture and creative opportunities for more people in places which for too long have been underserved. In doing so, it will help to redress an historic imbalance in arts funding. Uh, and I firmly believe that that work, alongside the uh, investments and other programmes which I've outlined, can ensure that our world-class arts and culture can continue to thrive into the future.